Hey, I'm Shan McKinnon, and this is Welcome to the Real World. Be just who you want to be, do it all successfully. Welcome to the real world. Welcome to the Real World focuses on various jobs across Hamilton geared towards students in grade 12 who are deciding on a career path, college and university students, or adults looking for a career change. I sat down with Ralph Rosel, a registered polyisonographic technologist of the Hamilton Sleep Disorder Clinic on Fridge Street to talk about his career. Hello and welcome to the Real World. I'm Shannon McKinnon and we are here today at a sleep disorder clinic where I'm talking to Ralph. So Ralph, for those who don't know, what is a sleep technician? A sleep technician is a health professional that performs polysomnograms, or better known as sleep tests, um, under the direction of a sleep physician to um, diagnose or help them diagnose sleep disorders on a patient. Um, basically it comes from the word polysomnogram, so we're better, better known as polysomnographic technologists. Polysomnogram comes from the Latin and Greek terms, um, so poly or polis for many, um, indicating many channels that we're monitoring throughout the, the, the sleep study. Somnus for sleep and graphene for to write. Um, polysomnograms consist of, sort of um, many channels that, that we're monitoring throughout the night, um, which includes uh, electro uh, encephalograms, so EEGs to monitor your brain activity, EOGs which are um, to monitor your eye movements throughout the night, EMGs to monitor skeletal muscle activities, ECGs uh, for the heart rate and rhythm along with respiratory efforts, airflow, uh, as well as oxygen saturations and pulse. So there's a lot of things going on. So essentially it's a, um, it's a compilation of biophysiological changes that occur during um, sleep and wake. Mm -hmm. So for uh, someone who wants to become a sleep technician, what is the education required? Um, typically you want to have a health background. So a lot of us come from, from different areas. Um, so some will have a neuroscience background, psychology background. Others come from other diagnostic professions such as, such as cardiovascular technology, um, respiratory therapy. Some are nurses. Um, most are foreign trained physicians as well, um, where they're sort of trying to acquire a little bit more experience in the Canadian health field. Um, but a lot of the things are pretty much done on site. So in, in a lab, that's where you get your training and you acquire the amount of hours that you need. And hopefully in, in a few years, once you've accumulated that, you're able to write a registration exam that has to be administered by the board. So the, there are two sort of governing regulatory bodies for sleep technology. One is um, called the BRPT, so the Board of Respiratory, uh, sorry, Board of Registered Polysomnographic Technologists. Another is the AESM, so the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. So they have their own credentialing body as well, where their um, designation is registered sleep technologist. And the other one is called registered polysomnographic technologist, but they're all in the same, really. Um, and a third sort of designation is mostly available in the, the United States, where they're respiratory therapists, but they have a subspecialty designation of sleep disorder specialist. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, so um, what is the ratio for being on your feet to at your desk? Are you on your feet more? Um, I would say you're probably on your desk a little bit more than on your feet. So in the beginning of, of um, your shift, um, you're probably spending about maybe four, three hours on your feet, um, trying to get everything, everyone sort of settled in, um, get applying all the electrodes and um, the monitoring equipment. And as time progresses, once the patient's asleep, you're really on your desk them doing the monitoring. Uh, periodically, you do have to get up if the patient needs to be disconnected for a washroom break, if they need to um, you know, sort of go out for uh, a quick break just because they, they, they're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, or even if to just troubleshoot and fix, um, fix the monitoring devices that have dislodged throughout the night. So uh, you're probably looking at about maybe 30% of, of the time um, on your feet and another 70% of the time um, you know, on, on your desk. 
there's a lot of night shift with this it, job. There is a lot, a lot of night shift. So the most, the, the majority of us will have to go through night shifts, and, and that's that's when people sleep. So so that's when you have to to run the tests. Um, so a lot of us are typically night owls. So mm -hmm. so if you're a night owl out there and you'd like to be in the healthcare field. Um, sleep tech might be sort of uh, an option for you as well. Um, I, I've always grown up sort of you know, staying awake at night, so it wasn't much of a <laughs> trend. So it was yeah, it was a perfect, perfect transition into, into this profession. And as time progresses, some people will transition into day, um, day responsibilities, and that sort of changes a little bit. Whereas you, some will do some day, daytime study monitoring. So there's two specific ones that, that we do run throughout the day. So one's called multiple sleep latency tests. Another is called maintenance of wakefulness tests. Um, the MSLTs or multiple sleep latency tests are, is a tool that they use, the physicians use really to um, diagnose or rule out narcolepsy or what we call idiopathic hypersomnia as well. So there's sort of um, a, a very important tool to, to see uh, if those dis disorders are present. Um, also, the maintenance of wakefulness test is used to uh, determine if someone, if an individual or a patient can stay awake uh, at a sort of specific time in a controlled situation. So those are the two main tests that can be run throughout the day. And other technologists will also do what's called scoring. So scoring is the analysis and uh, essentially quantifying the data that was gathered the night before uh, into sort of numerical data to make it a little bit easier for the physician to interpret and analyze to come up with a, uh, a com conclusion and recommendations in um, either treating uh, a disorder uh, or basically saying this patient doesn't have a disorder uh, present. Yeah, we were talking before about the different stages of sleep. So mm -hmm. there used to be five. Mm -hmm. But there isn't anymore. Yeah. So what are the four stages? So the four stages of sleep are, well, stage one is basically a tra transitionary stage of sleep from, from wake into sleep. Um, and then there's stage two, which is the most common uh, stage of sleep as we sort of get older. So it, it comprises probably close to about 50% of the night. And then we have slow wave sleep, which is stage three. And it used to be stage three and four, but they sort of com combined that into this one. Uh, one stage and then the most common, uh, not most common, sorry, uh, the most known form is REM sleep, um, rapid eye movement sleep, which is basically a dream stage, um, which is a little bit paradoxical in terms of um, you know, when people think that REM sleep is deep sleep. In REM sleep, people's um, brain activity is actually quite similar to when they're awake, so there's a lot of activity going on there. However, the, there, there's a paradoxical effect where your body is actually paralyzed. It's not, um, it, it, a lot of the muscles are paralyzed and prevented from sort of doing overt actions um, during your run, uh, during that, that stage of sleep so that it's a self-defense mechanism. So you don't act out your dreams, you don't punch out, <laughs> kick out or anything like that. Um, when that sort of system malfunctions, then someone typically uh, may be diagnosed with REM behavioral disorder, or it may be induced by medications as well. So there's, there's sort of uh, things that we watch out for when you're in REM sleep. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that in REM sleep, um, if someone is depressed, you yeah. actually sleep more in that state. Yeah, uh, we, we tend to find that there's a, a little bit of an increase in, in REM sleep during, uh, you know, sort of uh, people who have uh, mood disorders. Typically, once you add a um, SSRI, which is the most most common form of antidepressant, we tend to find that REM sleep reduces or it sort of gets pushed back later throughout the night. Um, so SSRIs are actually called um, REM suppressants as well. So th there is a direct effect of medications into uh, the stages of sleep as well. For sure. And the antidepressants uh, suppress. It REM does sleep. suppress REM, yes. Yeah, correct. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so typically, um, people would come to a sleep disorder clinic for sleep apnea? That is probably the most common uh, disorder that is being investigated, especially uh, um, in, in Ontario as well. Um, sleep apnea is basically a cessation of breath as you, you, you fall asleep. Um, there are sort of different levels of sleep apnea or different types um, uh, of sleep apnea. The most common form is what we call obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, where there's basically an obstruction in your airway, which um, you know, some symptoms can be snoring, um, excessive daytime sleepiness, um, or witnessed apneas, where people will sort of notice that someone is stopping breathing throughout the night. So we tend to, to investigate that to see, is it present? 
if it is present, how severe it is. Um, once we determine its severity, then we can, uh, or the physician can recommend treatment options that, uh, at that time. So Ralph, what is your advice for someone who wants to become a sleep technician? If you want to be a sleep technician, uh, I suggest sort of uh, um, going into the, definitely going into the sciences. So uh, some post-secondary education in, in health sciences is definitely an asset. You, you want to sort of be exposed to that. And um, you really need to, to be um, a good troubleshooter as well. So, so there, there are things that can uh, not necessarily go your way uh, throughout the night. So being uh, uh, being able to handle that situation uh, um, is definitely an asset. And also be willing to learn constantly. So for example, uh, I work at an in independent health facility. We're required to have at least um, 25 hours of continuing medical education a year. So you know, if, if you look at it, it's about two hours per, per month of extra education on top of that. Um, you can get that online, you can get that through meetings, conferences. But what that allows you to do is basically grow into your field and sort of learn and stay up to date as to what is going on in, in sleep medicine in general. So if, if you're um, you know, willing to learn uh, or be a lifelong learner, then definitely sleep medicine would be you know, a great path for you. What do you love most about this job? Ah, what do I love most about this job? Every night is different. So each patient is different. Uh, each individual has their own story. Um, you know, they're, they're, their own issues that, that will need to, to be um, sort of addressed and being being part of the, you know, the solution um, to, to hopefully improving their sleep is, is definitely uh, a part part of the job so you know, it's it's having pride in your job and knowing you know what you're making a difference in, in someone else's life uh, whether they realize it or not at, at, at times but um, there's obviously sort of a, a gratifying moment there. For sure, and it's such a critical thing that it's yeah. definitely rewarding. Well, this has been very fascinating. Yes. Ralph, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anna. Being such a unique career, I was curious to find out about what kind of schooling was needed and what you would learn in the particular courses. From my research, the closest program for aspiring students to take is offered through Victoria Hospital in London, Ontario, and is a four-week program. According to their website, students will get an overview of the history of sleep medicine, anatomy, and a proper understanding of how to use the polysonograph. Students will also be prepped in the BRPT standards of contact, professional associations, policies, and procedures. Thank you for tuning in to Welcome to the Real World. Tune in next week where I'll be highlighting another exciting career. Welcome to